Welcome to your favorite drive-in theater and a sparkling new season. Watch our screen and local newspapers for all the fine shows coming this way. Show after show will feature the latest hits, the biggest stars for fun-filled, pleasure-packed evenings. Relax, come as you are, and spend an enjoyable night out with the entire family. No parking problems, no babysitting problems. And there are always tasty snacks at our modern refreshment stand. Thanks, folks. And once again, welcome back. And this new season will feature the work of Plato. Tonight, Professor Kravitz will actually read to you an excerpt from the Republic of Plato as translated by Benjamin Jowett in 1888. Hello! We are now going to read just three pages from the Republic of Plato, and I don't even think these are the three most important pages, uh, but uh, I think there's there's something in these pages we we can we we can get right. There, there's much there that we can we can take our our intellectual pickaxes and pull forth some gems. So I'm I'm gonna read this. You can just lay back, relax. Uh, I'll give you uh, an experience of reading Plato's Republic with Professor Kravitz. All right, so we're actually, uh, there's 10 books to the Republic, and these are three pages from book three. And in this section of the Republic, we have, uh, this is written by Plato, uh, but, but it's a conversation, and the main character that's speaking is named Socrates, and he is currently talking with, and for much of the book he talks with, uh, a man named Glaucon, and Glaucon happens to be Plato's older brother, right? So Socrates is having a conversation with Plato's older brother, Glaucon. So we're just jumping into the middle of, of, of the conversation, and they're talking right now about education, right? And they're talking about how, how, how should we educate people? Especially if we're going to have a city that really shines, then we, we need to really think about education. Okay, so let's just start reading and see where this takes us. Okay. There can be no nobler training than that, he replied. And therefore, I said, Glaucon? Musical training is a more potent instrument than any other, because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul, in which they mightily fasten, imparting grace, and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful, or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature and with a true taste while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good and becomes noble in good he will justly blame and hate the bad now in the days of his youth, even before he is able to know the reason why. And when reason comes, he will recognize and salute the friend with whom his education has made him long familiar. Okay, so this is interesting. Uh, we read 
William James. And William James makes this big argument that people should study philosophy. And now we have here Socrates speaking to Glaucon. And in Socrates speaking here, he's speaking for Plato. And what is he saying? He's saying you should study music, right? The philosopher is now saying that music is important, musical training, that everybody should study music. And so I think that's pretty fascinating. Fascinating uh, that Plato is making the case that we should all study music. Why? Well, he says it makes its way inside our soul. It makes its way inside our soul. Music becomes very important. And we've actually, we've actually talked about music already in this class. Uh, if we go back to the the evening where we, we spoke about critical thinking and uh, one, one of the topics that night was something called cognitive dissonance cognitive dissonance and dissonance we said was a term from music right? that was where two notes did not come together in their sounding Right? There was some sort of imbalance uh, in the sound. And when we hear dissonance, we said that it actually causes pain within us. Right? We feel it inside us. Music makes its way inside our soul. And I think a lot of us feel that way, right? Music really touches us in a very deep way. And so dissonance in music... Uh, actually feels or causes pain we feel pain and harmony is the opposite of dissonance right so we have dissonance versus harmony and so dissonance is where two things don't go together where two notes do not go together. And in cognitive dissonance, right, there we're talking about ideas. So cognitive dissonance, where two ideas do not go together. So you might have two ideas about yourself, that you believe in being super healthy and it's important to be healthy. And you also might have at the same time the idea that you enjoy smoking. And so these two ideas are hard to hold together, that you both believe in being healthy and that you believe in smoking. And so when you have that sort of dissonance, psychology, psychologists would study it. How do people handle that? And there's various things we do, right, to try to allow ourselves to hold those ideas. We try to somehow temper the dissonance, uh, alter the ideas so, so, so that there's not such a strong... Uh, jarring sound within us by having those two ideas uh, okay so so we actually have been thinking about this already in some ways and here is Plato uh, saying that everybody should study music and uh, that there's a certain grace that that you can learn in studying music and that if you don't study music, you never you never gain that that sort of grace. Uh, but it's also studying music is a study in harmony, and, and that's going to be super important to to Plato. Harmony, right? Uh, when things go well together, right? All right, well, let's continue and uh, see where they go from here. Okay, move down. 
also we get this idea of harmony good right because it feels good it's in some ways to hear something harmonious could be healing with inside us and that dissonance is bad right so that harmony is healing and dissonance is bad it harms and uh, these, these moral terms are really important that harmony is good and that dissonance is bad and something very natural right it's just something we feel when we hear dissonance when we listen to music often there's dissonance in it and that causes a lot of drama in music but it always gets resolved usually and then uh, when it's resolved there's harmony again and that's sort of the resolution in the music okay so let's see what glaucon says back yes he said i quite agree with you in thinking that our youth should be trained in music and on the grounds which you mentioned all right so glaucon agrees uh, glaucon kind of agrees with a lot that socrates says to him in in this dialogue okay just as in learning to read i said we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet which are very few in all their recurring sizes and combinations, not slighting them as unimportant whether they occupy a space large or small, but everywhere eager to make them out, and not thinking ourselves perfect in the art of reading until we recognize them wherever they are found. And Glaucon says, true. Or, as we recognize the reflection of letters in the water, or in a mirror, only when we know the letters themselves, the same art and study giving us the knowledge of both. Right, so this, this is kind of a strange turn, but okay. So we need to learn to read. That seems to be pretty important. And here we have Socrates talking about what it means to learn to read. And that uh, even back then there was all different shapes to the alphabet, lots of different fonts, right? And to learn how to read, uh, it wasn't a matter of just learning how to read one font, right? If you can only read letters that are in Times New Roman, then you've got a problem, right? You need to be able to read all the different fonts. It shouldn't matter what font. And it also shouldn't matter what size the font is, right? So, uh, we need to learn to read. And remember, we know we know something about, about Plato uh, so far in this course. We know that Plato is a rationalist. That's that's an important context. Let's just put this here in context. Plato is a rationalist. So, what does that mean? Well, we have some idea what that means. We're gonna we're gonna get a, a better sense of it as we go along. But we know from William James that that means you start with principles you start with the whole then you go to parts you use deduction um, and in starting with principles definitions rules laws right you start with uh, these, these rules and laws are things that you, you hold inside your head right in your mind your, your, your reason and that's different than the empiricist who began by using their, their five senses and went out and experienced the world that way. Okay, so we know Plato is a rationalist, so reading is going to be super important, right, for a rationalist. Uh, so this makes sense, but it's kind of surprising that before this point, before reading, we start with music. But uh, that kind of does happen, right? We kind of learn music, we can learn music before we learn how to read. 
uh, when, when we're children, we start to learn songs right from the beginning, uh, from our parents, school. Uh, before, before we learn to read, uh, we, we learn music. Okay, so uh, one thing we know right now for Socrates, for Socrates here, but for Plato, is that size does not matter, right? That is resolved. He said it right there in, in, on the page, size doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter how big that letter is or how small it is. Uh, but size does not matter and does not, he said, convey any sense of importance. And that is going to be something that's going to be important for us when we get to reading uh, about the divided line. And uh, the divided line is a sort of a mental image that we're given by Socrates that sort of tells us about, gives us a picture of existence. And uh, there's a question about what sorts of things, are there more or less of things? And as he's, he's drawing these lines and he's telling us the different parts, uh, there's a question about which, which part, because he says they're not even. So one side is larger than the other. And this is going to give us, I think, a clue when we're reading that, that just because one side is larger doesn't mean it's more important. Um, okay, so we'll just keep that in the back of our mind, that uh, size does not matter, and that uh, a larger size does not mean that something is more important. And I'm going to put in here, we will remember this when we are trying to decipher the divided line. Okay. So uh, then Socrates starts to talk about uh, that we don't just see words in different sizes and different shapes. Um, we also sometimes see the reflection of letters in water. And what happens when we see the reflection of a letter? Well, it's backwards, right? So we get the mirror image. And, uh, but we still are able to recognize the letters. So now the letter doesn't look at all like we, we, we usually uh, come across uh, when we're reading. And yet we still are able to recognize the letter itself. And this is pushing us towards something that is very, very important in Platonism, right? Plato's philosophy and his rationalism, that the thing itself is not what we see, but that what we see helps us to recall the thing itself, which I guess it is residing somewhere within us, maybe, maybe for Plato, within our soul. Uh, and that reading is about being able to sort of recognize when you come across all these different instances of letters, what letter that actually is. And that letter that it actually is is just something that's inside our mind. All right, so Glaucon says exactly. Let me just say up here. So the letters we come across look differently and can be quite odd like a mirror image, but they all help us, or they all cause us to recall or recognize 
the letter itself. The letter itself, which resides inside our heads, minds, soul. Okay. So Galakhan says exactly, exactly, Socrates. That's what I was going to say. And Socrates says back, Even so, as I maintain, neither we nor our guardians, whom we have to educate, and I'd say you guys are going to be the guardians, right? the future generation who are going to help preserve uh, life, society, civilization. So you guys are going to be the next guardians. You need to be educated as guardians. Uh, this is this is a term in the in the book. Guardians are uh, those that that are, are going to protect this perfect city. All right. So neither we nor our guardians, whom we have to educate, can ever become musical until we and they know the essential forms of temperance, courage, liberality, magnificence, and their kindred, as well as the contrary forms in all their combinations, and can recognize them and their images wherever they are found, not slighting them either in small things or great but believing them all to be within the sphere of one art and study. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, uh, it seems that we're, we're sort of combining together a little bit reading and music. And he says that in order to become musical, right, it's more than just studying music. To become musical yourself, you need to know the music of the soul and then he starts to list sort of different notes of the soul like temperance courage liberality these are all virtues right? virtues that one can have that that can characterize the soul to be courageous liberality means to be someone who freely gives is a very giving person uh, be magnificent, right? Someone who doesn't allow small things to ruin them, right? Stands above all that. All these different different virtues. Temperance means that's someone who has self discipline and can can do things in moderation. Doesn't take things to excess or too little, but does the right sort of middle level. Uh, one who is temperate. Okay, so these these sort of notes of the soul and knowing them and the contrary forms, right? The dissonance that can be caused in the soul when not a virtue but a vice happens to be there, right? Instead of being courageous, being someone who's cowardly, uh, that would cause a dissonance. So through reading, we learn about all these different virtues. And when you read Plato, this is, this is a lot of what you study, are these different virtues. And by reading them and knowing music, you can put these together and hear the music of the soul. And he's going to take this a little bit further now. He's going to bring it back to, to actual music and harmony. But before we get there, uh, we we need to go to a uh, a little a little break, and in this break, uh, well, we need to know about something called free TV. Monsters do have their place in the zoo, in your nightmares, in the deep in your favorite horror movies. But not in your living room, on your TV.
Don't let pay TV be the monster in your living room. Pay TV and cable TV companies are seeking the right to charge you for the very programs you now get free. If you want to stop pay TV and save free television, sign the petition in the lobby of this theater. Let your lawmakers know how you feel in the fight against pay TV and cable TV. All right, we're back. And, uh, well, YouTube is free TV. Uh, okay, so, um, just wrote down the notes, the, these virtues that, uh, that Plato has given us and Socrates has told us. And, uh, all right. So let's see where it goes. So Glaucon says, most assuredly, right? We should, we should study that. And Socrates says back, and when a beautiful soul harmonizes with a beautiful form, when the two are cast in one mold, that will be the fairest of sights to him who has an eye to see it. Okay, there's a lot in there in that one that one sentence. Uh, I'm just going to bring a little bit of it out so we have a deeper sense of what we're reading about uh, we could go a lot deeper and if you decide to study philosophy or you want to come back uh, it's all there for us to, for us to, to dig deep into um, okay so one of the words that comes up there is form and it came up before here uh, as an essential form and he's talking about the different virtues. And that's an important word for, for Platonism, this idea of form. Uh, it's sometimes translated as idea. And uh, a lot of times when we talk about Platonism, we're talking about this theory of the forms or the ideas. Uh, it's a difficult word to translate. And in in the ancient Greek, uh, we have the word idea, which seems closer to idea. But uh, it, that doesn't capture all of what it means. Because uh, we also have here uh, this word mold. And that's an important term. And that comes out more in the word form. So mold. This is British uh, version. And this isn't the mold that, that you get when something is wet and dark. Uh, this is the mold from, let's say, pottery, where you create uh, a shape and then you put things into it, or baking might be better. And so you, you create sort of a, a shape that you can bake something within, and then when it bakes, it, go, it becomes that, that, that shape uh, when, when, when it rises. It rises into that shape. And this is important uh, in this theory of forms, uh, that, that these are like models, that, that things are modeled after. Because we said all those letters remind us of this letter inside us. So the letter inside us when we're reading is the model, and then all the other uh, letters that we, we see when we're reading are uh, copies of that model, and, and each copy is different, right? Copies don't have to be the same. You, know, you can have a lot of variation, but something about them reminds us back to the model, the mold in which they are shaped, right? So uh, this is gonna be important. We're gonna talk more about this, this, this theory of the forms or ideas, idea. Uh, a mold, uh, a model that copies or shaped from safe now. Okay, so uh, rationalism right, is about ideas and they're in the mind. And what part of you is the part that is engaging and thinking 
Well, for Plato, that's the soul. Right? The soul is where we think that's where ideas are. That's where ideas meet us, is in wherever the soul is. This dimension of the soul is the dimension of ideas. So we want, we want to keep that in mind. Is where the ideas also exist. Uh, so here, when he talks about a beautiful soul harmonizing with a beautiful form, uh, we have a lot going on there. We have the ideas, but we also have the soul itself right, being characterized by these different virtues. And when a soul is, has all these virtues in harmony, ringing out together, uh, he says there's something that's beautiful, and that there's something about the two of those things that they're cast from the same mold, the same form, the same idea. And he says that this is a fair sight. So we have beauty here, and we have fairness. These are important concepts for for Socrates and his Platonist. I mean, for Plato and his Platonist. Beauty, justice, and we've already talked about how when things are in harmony, they're good, right? They're healing. They improve us. They make us better. So this, these three different aspects come together. In the soul here beauty justice and good and we're going to talk about the ideas of beauty the idea of justice the idea of good and for for Plato where all three of these come together in one is sort of the ultimate thing and we have something that's beautiful just and good that's that's the greatest something could be so education aims in some ways to both teach us beauty justice and goodness but also for us to become beautiful beautiful people just people and good people all at once and when that happens oh the harmony who, who could see something more beautiful he says that's a beautiful sight to see and but not everybody could see it you really need to know what beauty is and justice is and goodness is to be able to recognize it in others all right so glaucon says the fairest indeed and the fairest is also the loveliest and glaucon says that may be assumed of course socrates so socrates continues and the man who has the spirit of harmony will be most in love with the lovely, loveliest, but he will not love him who is of an inharmonious soul. All right, so, uh, yes. The one who is in harmony will also uh, be see harmony in others, but also seek the highest level of harmony. Right? And, and will avoid and not desire in harmonious souls right? that will be something that they, that they will not seek or desire or, or go after okay wow God. that is true he replied if the deficiency be in his soul but if there be any merely bodily defect in another he will be patient of it and will love all the same ah. so this is interesting. So the rationals, right? The rationals is concerned with reason, the mind, uh, understanding what things mean, right? Proper definitions, proper principles. And so they make a point here to say that what's important is what's in the mind, what's in the soul. That the body is not as important. And if there's problems with the body, well, that really doesn't matter. In fact, someone could look past any issues 
you know, however the body may may exist, one can look past that. Uh, particularly if one is a Platonist uh, in rationalism, one one looks past that. That's not important. So the body is not that important in Platonism. Right? It's not how someone looks, what kind of body they have, what matters is their soul and the kind of mind. Right? Are they courageous? Are they temperate? All those different virtues. Okay, so let's get back to the page. Where are we over here? Okay, so we have Socrates. I perceive, I said, that you have or have had experiences of the sorts, and I agree. But let me ask you another question. Has excess of pleasure any affinity to temperance? Okay, so there's a little joke here going on uh, about about you know having bad bodies and uh, well Socrates was known to be quite physically ugly right there was things about his body apparently that were just not attractive at all and everybody talked about it and uh, and yet Socrates is loved by all these people, uh, not because of physically how he looks, but because of his soul, the beautiful soul he has. And uh, so he's saying, you know, well, maybe he has some experience with this. And uh, even Plato himself was, was joked about in terms of physical appearance. Apparently, uh, he was a wrestler and he had uh, wide shoulders, but he also had this massive forehead. That, that people would make jokes of. Uh, okay, so um, there's this little inside joke going on, and where do we go next? Um, talks about this other question, and Socrates always has questions. So he asks, "Has excess of pleasure any affinity?" To temperance. So we talked about being temperate was being moderate. And he's he wants to know in infinity, is there a connection? Are these are these connected uh, in excess of pleasure? Right? Excessive pleasure. And Glaucon replies, How can they be how can that be? He replied, Pleasure deprives a man of the use of his faculties quite as much as pain. Ah. So both pain, too much pain, or too much pleasure, the excesses, will uh, keep us from being rationalist, right? Being able to think clearly and deeply about something. So excessive pain and pleasure get in the way of thinking clearly. So this is going to be something at odds with the rationalist. The rationalist is going to want to avoid extreme pain, which is natural, but also extreme pleasure, which one might might not uh, want to avoid or might think is something we don't need to avoid. And here, as they think about it, they say, no, yeah, extreme pleasure is also something we should avoid. Uh, because it deprives us of our highest faculties, right? Our faculties to understand something, to reason. And it deprives us of our highest faculties, our ability to reason. And, and that's why when we're in a lot of pain in life, uh, 
it's dangerous because that pain kind of short circuits our ability to to step back and be objective and to, to really try to think things through okay so let's, let's see where they're going um or any affinity to virtue in general right? not just temperance but all the other virtues and he says none whatever any affinity to wantonness and intemperance and then he says yes the greatest all right so what's wantonness and intemperance intemperance is the opposite of being temperate so it's instead of being someone who's moderate being intemperate someone who's excessive now wonton this is not the wonton you'd find at a chinese restaurant right wonton soup that's two o's this has an a here wantonness means someone who does something kind of spuriously uh, all of a sudden you know they they decide to do something so it's acting sort of irrational just out of nowhere just wanting to do something and doing it and doing it excessively and, and then he says yes the greatest that someone who's wanton and temperate that's linked up with excessive pleasure and also can lead to probably excessive pain many times so Glaucon says yes the greatest Socrates continues and is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love uh, so sensual love this is exactly what you think uh, this is why Plato is not for kids uh, he's 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 talking here uh, about physical sexual love acts and saying excessive pleasures and that connected with that and Glaucon's answer no nor a matter All right, so that sexual love this is when we're the least rational is when we sort of he's sort of connecting having sex to sort of entering this state of madness and uh, so that's physical love so there's this connection between physical love as sex and connecting this to madness and madness is irrational in opposition to rationality rationalism okay so what, what does he say here quite true he said okay so go out and agrees Socrates then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love so true love is something that's not physical love. True love is not sex. Right? Sex is maybe a copy of love, uh, this, this madness, but it's not true love. True love is going to be for, for Plato something that's not physical. It's going to be something in the mind. It's going to be a part of the soul. Uh, so we have true love not physical not mere sex it will be located in the soul and it will be rational in some way okay Uh, this is a nice nighttime story for all of you. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, okay, where was I? Um, right, so Socrates continues. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort. Hmm. Uh... Okay, 
so here is Plato uh, saying we we should not engage in any sort of sex uh, hmm. I don't know big question so for a Platonist is physical sex off limits let's see what he says uh, well Glaucon says no indeed Socrates it must never come near them all right so is physical sex something that could possibly harm true love right because we said things that are dissonant are harmful they cause pain is physical sex something that could harm true love and therefore if you want to have true love right love that's something that occurs between two souls and not between their bodies uh, should should you purposely decide not to not to be sexual right? we, we may have heard of the term platonic love right? and this is understood as non sexual love right? that's a common term oh we're just platonic uh, okay so we kind of see where this comes from all right let's see where we may go here um, so All right, so Socrates responds. Then I suppose that in the city where we are founding, which we are founding, you would make a law to the effect that a friend should use no other familiarity to his love than a father would use to his son, and then only for a noble purpose. And he must first have the other's consent. In this rule, is to limit him in all his intercourse and he is never to be seen going further or if he exceeds he is to be deemed guilty of coarseness in bad taste okay we're getting in some some pretty shaky terrain for the modern uh modern sense of how things work uh we have a completely different culture back in ancient Greece and Athens where uh, sexuality uh, relationships uh, becoming a, an adult a sexual person is treated very differently than it is now and there were practices uh, back then that uh, would not be acceptable now in, in today's world uh first there was an acceptance of homosexual activity and relationships that was normalized and most people participated in uh so so that's that's something that's very different than sort of a, a, a culture now there was also a practice uh that was called pederasty and this practice was where adult men uh, took on uh, boys that were that were going through a period where they're going to become adults and they were becoming sexual and they took them on as lovers uh, to uh, teach them uh, how, how to become an adult and this this pederasty was a, a, a relationship between a man and a boy and uh, it was something that was a common practice at this point uh, it goes out of fashion and uh, but in Athens this this is an important part of uh, of development and okay so what's happening here uh, you're saying okay uh, we are still going to have this this sexual education that occurs um, when these men take 
uh, a pederast. Uh, and but he's he's going to put some some rules on it uh, that the boy should not be abused. That the boy must must provide consent that this is important, um, and that this rule should limit all all men in all their intercourse. That they should always ask for consent in in, in what they do, and that it's for a noble purpose. What is that noble person purpose? Uh, well, if we read other dialogues, it seems that. Physical love is not something that that Socrates and Platonism is going to completely deny someone of that that this is sort of a natural part and that perhaps uh, people need sexual release and Aristotle will, will write a lot about the emotions and that they build up. And there's a whole theory of emotions that, that, that we build, they build up and they need outlets. They need to be released. And this probably connects up with sexuality and uh, sexual frustration and, and, and wanting sexual release. Um, but for, for Plato, uh, physical love should remind us of the true love that's inside our soul so it's it's the first sort of step and it should hopefully lead us to this pure love between people which is not physical but is something that we're, we're two souls uh, that are in harmony and themselves become harmony harmonized together and that's that's beautiful love when two souls uh, are no longer dissonant but in harmony. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Glaucon is going to, of course, agree because why would he disagree with Socrates? Uh, that would be a big mistake. Uh, I quite agree, he said. And then Socrates continues Thus, much of music, which makes a fair ending, for what should be the end of music if not the love of beauty? So that music itself is also not an end. So we learn music, but music should give in us a love not just for music, but for beauty itself. When we hear beautiful music, it should turn us inward to the idea of beauty all by itself. And that we should fall in love with that also. Glaucon, I agree, he said. And after music, oh wait, hold on a second. Oh my gosh, we need a break. And in this break, uh, we're going to think for a moment about pride, right? We all we all need pride. Um, we should all have some pride, but certain kinds of pride uh, might not be that that healthy or safe. Some people take pride in physical fitness. Others seem to take a pride in the lack of it. There are those even who find the mastering of the most peculiar tricks fills them with pride. And those who encourage them with a wager. Still, all this is harmless enough. But there are those who take a pride in this sort of trick, and they're not harmless. You've probably met them. They can usually knock an hour off what you thought was a fast drive. And they usually finish up on a slow drive, chauffeur-driven. So learn the lesson before it's too late. Remember, there are other people using the road, other people with equal rights, a right to the road, a right to stay alive on the road. And they're not thought readers. Let them know where you're going and always make sure they know well in advance.
okay, two things. Please don't drive crazy. Take pride in your driving. Uh, second thing, take pride in your philosophizing, right? Be proud of reading Plato. Be proud of thinking about all these things. Uh, definitely take pride in that. Okay, uh, let's finish this up. We're getting close to the end. Um, so we just were talking about music and that music uh, in itself should, should turn us inward into the soul, into a love of beauty itself. Uh, and Glaucon agreed. And then Socrates says, and, and after music comes gymnastic, in which our youth are next to be trained. Wow. So that's before reading, right? That's after music, So, but it's going to be before reading. So that's interesting. So after music, but before reading, we must teach... Uh, children, we must all learn gymnastics. And gymnastics is just a nice term for uh, all the different sort of physical exercises and physical games. Uh, gym. Okay, so that's also kind of a little bit surprising that the philosopher is saying, yes, you need to learn something that has nothing to do with the mind, right? Gym is all about the body all right so let's see what what's said here uh, certainly of course black on agrees gymnastics as well as music should begin in early years the training should be careful and should continue through life so you should never stop exercising right Plato is t Plato the rationalist all about the mind is saying never stop exercising even if you happen to be quarantined inside your home or your important apartment because there's a pandemic still try to do some exercise all right um, now my belief is and this is Socrates continuing and this is a matter upon which I should like to have your opinion and confirmation of my own but which is crazy for for Socrates to say that because he wants confirmation. Glaucon confirms everything he says practically. But okay. So my own belief is not that the good body by any bodily excellence improves the soul, but on the contrary, that the good soul by her own excellence improves the body as far as this may be possible. What do you say? And Glaucon confirms, yes, I agree. Okay. So, what's, what's Plato saying there? He is saying that um, a good body doesn't mean that you're going to have a good soul. Right? A good body does not mean that you will have a good soul. All right, so if you date based on good body, right when you're choosing who you're going to date that does not mean they're going to be have a good soul inside them on the contrary though he says having a good soul will improve the body as much as far as may be possible so that if you inside you you have harmony then you're more likely to take care of yourself and as best you can uh, be healthy physically so but to some degree it does work the opposite and Glaucon agrees and uh, we're coming up to the end here so Socrates continues then to the mind when adequately trained we shall be right in handing over the more particular care of the body. And in order to avoid prolixity, we will now only give the general outlines of the subject. Uh, so he says that who should be in control 
of you. He says, once you get to a point that you've matured enough that you are able to reason, right? and you guys are right now, you're able to reason that you should put reason in charge of the decisions you make in life. That you shouldn't make choices based on what your body wants, but more on what your mind uh, decides. Right? You put reason in charge. And this is going to be a really big issue for Plato and Platonism, is that reason should lead. Reason should be in charge. We shouldn't be making decisions based on our gut, right? The gut, something physical. Uh, when you make decisions based on your gut, you're not trying to reason out. You're just, what does your body tell you? And for, for, for Plato and Platonism, that's the worst way to make decisions. You need to understand things. You need to go through and rationally figure out what is best and what is reality. Okay. Uh, then he says he's going to just give an outline of the subject. He says to avoid prolixity, which that, that means to avoid talking too much. And I have done that. I'm sorry. I've talked too much here. Uh, it's interesting that word though, prolixity, uh, that lixity part is connected with liquor. And both those words come from uh, a root word of to flow. When things flow, you pour, you pour the liquor. And when you talk a lot, just words just flow out of your mouth. And what does he talk about next? He talks about intoxication. He says, we must abstain from intoxication. I'm going to stop there because I know you guys are in college and you don't want to hear that. But we know that intoxication uh, is to lose some of our faculty to reason, right? We can't think straight if we're intoxicated. And this, of course, is going to be something a rationalist is going to be uh, quite afraid of and be something they want to avoid, right? That, that sort of bodily state will affect the soul, will affect the mind, will affect your ability to reason. All right, well, in order to avoid prolixity, uh, I'm going to end this right here. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, my, my reading to you of a few pages from the Republic of Plato.